Hey guys, Youngblood with you, and in today's video we're actually going to be talking about a question that was answered in the interview that Crash Academy had with Chris Roberts at one of the GamesCon events. So I'll make sure to put a link in the uh, description below um, so you can actually go see that full uh, interview on uh, their channel. Now the topic that was discussed was regarding ship pricing and how it's going to look long term in the game and how long it's going to take to earn various ships in game. And we didn't get the old standardized answer of one week to earn a constellation, which is great because that was a really ambiguous answer before anyways, um, because there was a lot of different factors that went into that. Now, Roberts went on to talk about how they're going to be drawing analogs from real life examples and how we're going to be seeing a scaling effect taking place in game, much like we see in the real world. You know, the best example was looking at weaponry, you know, saying a pistol cost a few hundred bucks, an automatic rifle cost a few thousand dollars, an F-16 is several million dollars, and an aircraft carrier in the Navy is several billion dollars. Now, if we have to apply that to the Star Citizen world, we may end up looking at the pistol being something like an Aurora LN, and the Super Hornet being the F-16, and the Bengal carrier obviously being the carrier. And based on that, we start to see how the scaling of pricing is going to look in the universe. Now, one of the most eye-opening statements was in regard to how, in the game, we're likely going to see a much larger disparity in the pricing between the tiers of ships, meaning that larger ships are going to be exponentially higher in most situations as far as cost. So today, for example, the Idris is about 10 times more expensive than a Freelancer, but at release, we may end up seeing that Idris actually costing closer to 20 or 30 times more expensive, or maybe even significantly more beyond that. So that's important information to have because it tells us a few things that we need to consider going into the game. Most notably that larger ships, like I've mentioned before, are going to be really best served as organizational goals. You know, trying to earn a capital ship in game sounds like it's going to be a much tougher challenge than we initially had thought. Um, you know, so a lot outside of the fact that we're going to have operating expenses and crew sizes to be considered as well, organizations are going to have to be very focused on, you know, running missions to help them earn something like a capital ship. Um, and players interested in being involved in capital ships are really going to be best suited to finding an organization with similar goals. Along those same lines, larger organizations are going to have a significantly better advantage if they're pooling their funds to start building up their sorts of fleets. Now, but with increased price, we do hear Chris talking about how with more expensive ships and bigger ships, we end up getting more capability. You know, a bigger cargo ship can carry more cargo, thus taking on more profit. A better and more expensive explorer may be given more challenging and better paying jobs to find stuff. Basically, while they want more, I guess, expensive bigger ships um, that are more of a commitment to earning, um, they're going to end up rewarding you after the big credit sink with better earning opportunities as you move forward, which is a model we've seen in a lot of different games to this point, like Elite Dangerous. So does all of this mean that now buying bigger ships is all of a sudden making this game pay to win? No, but it's not as clear of a no as it was before. Because if buying a bigger, better ship with real money now is saving you a lot of money later on, and it gives you better earning opportunities right off the bat, then you certainly at least have an advantage from the start. But that's not really pay to win when there isn't really a win in this game. Now there isn't anything exclusive, there's nothing you can't earn or steal in the game. Everybody can get to the same place. We're just going to be starting out in different places. So I think it's important to actually do things like this for the game though, because outside of having an in-depth and engaging environment, a sense of accomplishment when you're able to save and buy what you've had your eye on is going to allow you that feeling of progression, and then is going to continue to open up new and more exciting gameplay options from that point. Now, I do find one thing interesting about this, and that's most specifically to combat ships. Combat is really a game of pilot skill. You know, a top pilot in an Aurora is going to kill an average pilot in a Super Hornet every time. So in cargo transport or salvage or something like that, there's going to be some skill involved, like finding the right routes or buying low and selling high or finding wrecks and picking the best parts to salvage. But the level of... I guess the level and the rewards between the average and the great in those careers has to be less significant to the end result than it is going to be in combat. In combat, the worst pilot dies. They lose their ship. They start over. In cargo, the worst hauler ends up making a bit less money. And that's a big difference. But what I'm getting at is it seems like that while there's going to be differences and capability differences between the combat ships, while skill, skill ends up being the real determining factor in overall success in most situations, and that seems to be the category with a bit more flexibility. You, you can't really say the same thing going from a whole D to a whole E. The whole E is going to make you more money every time. 
So hopefully we should get some more information as the economy starts to get more and more implemented and kind of involved. And when we get ship purchasing in game as an option, it's going to be a whole lot easier to really make determinations on how this is all going to look. Um, one quick note before we wrap this up, this video was actually the suggestion of uh, one of my patrons. And speaking of patrons, we're really close to hitting the monthly goal to open up a monthly live stream um, that I'll be doing. Um, so for those of you that have been asking if I'm considering doing live streaming, we'll be starting that option pretty soon. And for those of you that are interested in supporting the channel through Patreon um, and to get just kind of the interaction benefits that come with that, there is a link in the description as well as an annotation above pointing you to the site. But with that being said, I appreciate you guys watching. If you have questions or opinions on how you interpreted that interview with Chris, get them in the comments. I'd love to read them. Otherwise, stay tuned for a whole lot more content coming soon. Have yourselves a wonderful day and take care.